Hey friends, Why Squirrels needs your support. We're looking for sponsors for the podcast, for the website, for the newsletter. We'll give you some shout outs on social and all the good places. Reach out to us today. Hello at whysquirrels.com. And in the subject, just write sponsorship and we'll follow up with you directly. Thanks. Why Squirrels is brought to you by The Root Down, an ADHD inspired presentation and process to know, respect, and connect yourself. Available now for conferences and savvy companies, The Root Down will bring your team together, teach them about neurodiversity, and a lot more. Check out The Root Down, read the reviews over at wisequirrels.com today. You know how you have 15 things to remember right before a podcast? Oh, heck yeah. That was one of them. Story of my yeah. life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, no, I don't, I don't know. I might've read a book about it once. <laughs> it's like a miracle I'm even here. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Welcome to Wise Squirrels, the podcast for late diagnosed adults with ADHD. I'm your host, Dave Delaney. Today, I am thrilled to bring a familiar voice to the podcast, one that if you are at all in the ADHD space or have been reading books about it or researching it, you might already know Dr. Tamara Rosier. She's the founder of the ADHD Center of West Michigan and the author of the best-selling book, Your Brain's Not Broken. Tamara has been a part of this community since I joined the community, um, which is not really a long time when you think about it, but she wrote the first book that I read when I discovered I have ADHD and Your Brain's Not Broken is a must. Uh, it definitely helped me in a lot of ways. And today we're going to be talking about a lot, the power of metaphors, uh, the role of acceptance and self-compassion the need for open dialogue with our loved ones, our colleagues, our friends, and a lot more. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, there is a lot of laughter during this episode, so I hope you really enjoy it a lot. By the way, I got a lot of feedback from my last episode, and I just wanted to say thank you if you reached out. And if you have comments or questions or anything, don't hesitate to reach out, please. Um, you can do so by emailing me directly, hello at wisequirrels.com. That'll go right to me. You can also record an audio comment if you'd like to hear yourself on an episode. Also, if you have questions, um, post them to me. Share, share, share them. Share, share, share. Three times. That's how many times I said that. Anyway. I'm excited to get this episode rolling, so I'm going to go ahead and share the interview with you in just a sec. A quick reminder, the content provided in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered a substitute for professional medical advice or diagnosis or treatment. I am not a medical professional, so always seek the advice of one instead of just going with anything you hear on this show. <laughs> Reliance on any information provided by this podcast is solely at your own risk. So just go talk to your doctor. And with that, I bring you Tamara. I've been so excited to talk to you and I, and and uh, and have you on the podcast. I, yeah, I'm. Uh, I can't say I'm a longtime fan because I only found out that I have ADHD a few months back. Oh wow! Yeah, and you started a podcast about it. Of course, naturally, this is what our people do. This yes. <laughs> This is what we do. Yes. Um, yes. So yeah, the, the, the quick version is at 50. I, yeah, I was diagnosed. Uh, so I'm now 51, but it was this year. So naturally, uh, yeah, I started whysquirrels.com so I could kind of openly share uh, what I was learning. And then um, as a veteran podcaster, it seemed uh, logical to, uh, to have a podcast. So I did that as well. I've been podcasting for 18 years this year. Um, oh, wow. Which is insane. But um, yeah. Yeah. What's the new book that you're working on? Well, it's not titled yet because that's a joint dance between mm. my publisher and me. Uh, so it's the book that isn't named yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it is about families and ADHD occurs in families. Mm -hmm. And many of us have wounds because of ADHD 
being in our families. Uh And I'm speaking specifically about emotional control, forgetting to pick kids up, you know, all the things that affect us growing up. And so what I'm trying to do is offer, hey, here's what you do when you find yourself in an ADHD family. And here are some things that you can do to try to turn it around, make it more positive. Is it more for the neuro? Uh, uh, typical reader or is it so, or, or someone like, is it more for the the parent or, or the, the kid? Yeah. So I literally wrote it for anyone. Mm-hmm. So anyone at a 10th grade reading level can find themselves in this book. Okay. So I wrote it to my ADHD peeps. Yeah. But knowing just like with your brain's not broken, yeah. knowing that, the neurotypicals will be looking over our shoulders, also reading it. Knowing what I what I know now, I've learned a lot about how it's very hereditary. And so yes. to your point about the book, I've learned that the uptick in, in diagnosis of ADHD in adults really started spiking during the beginning of the pandemic and quarantine mm-hmm. when, when our lives were all turned upside down and suddenly our schedules were out of whack and we were working from home and dealing with kids and spending more time on social media, falling down misinformation rabbit holes and, 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 and legitimate information as well. But um, all of these things, plus the added stress of the pandemic and, and life. And then many people also sought out therapy during that time, including myself, um, that uh, the, these kind of combined things led to an uptick in the diagnosis of more people realizing, oh, wait, I have ADHD. <laughs> um, so that's why I was curious about sort of the hereditary aspect. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Barkley, Russell Barkley, and I know you're mm-hmm. familiar with him, he estimates um, above 80% of di- – right, so if you have a child – With ADHD. Nope. Okay. Sorry. I've got to take a running start at this and say it right. So I'm going to say, try to say it again. That's fine. Oh, by the way, ADHD people, we we never tell stories really in a sequential, logical (laughs) manner. We kind of tell it from all sides at once. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that when you're sharing data, but that's what my brain does naturally. So (laughs) that's what you guys just heard. It's just a, that's my brain. Yeah. (laughs) So let's try it again. Um, If you have a dad with ADHD, that child is 80% likely to also have ADHD, Mm. according to Russell Barkley. Mm -hmm. And certainly an authority in that. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. yeah, No one argues with a Barkley. So, so this is really high. Uh, One time I had a client who's an anesthesiologist and I mean, those guys are the studs of medicine. Mm. You have to be exact. Yeah. She had ADHD. Mm. And, you know, just, just, a, I'm highlighting that just to go, hey, our people can be very smart, mm-hmm. even though we lose our keys on a regular basis. Right. Um, but something she said to me was listen, in medicine, we would look at a 0.01 correlation, mm. we have a 0.5 at least. We should be taking this very, very seriously in families. Yeah. And and that, that's always really stuck with me. Well, also that so many people are uh, suspect they have ADHD, but they, they're not willing, perhaps because of stigmas or, or anything else, but they're not really willing to, to get tested and to find out if they do, in fact, have ADHD. When I... When I, 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 I joke that I kind of came out of the mental health closet, so to speak, when I was diagnosed because I'm very open. And so I went on Facebook and I wrote a blog post and so on and said, hey, guess what? I have ADHD. And I started getting a lot of messages from friends who said, you know, I think I have ADHD, but, you know, I'm not hyperactive. And, th- and so then I have to explain what I've learned very much from your book as well, by the way. Thank you uh, from Your Brain's Not Broken about how adults show the H. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we know that the DSM is woefully behind. Mm. And it's pretty sad when we can say, hey, TikTok has surpassed the manual that we use to diagnose uh, ADHD. Mm. And I'm not saying TikTok is an authority, but TikTok is kind of showing us what more recent research is suggesting. And the very recent research we can see the brain. 
now. And we can see fMRI scans of it. Mm. Dave, you've had a lot of people on this. So I just want to, I'll just do this very quickly because yeah. I know that you have an educated audience. Mm -hmm. But just to remind people that if you tap on your front, on your forehead, that's your prefrontal cortex, that's the place where you plan and organize. Mm. Those of us with ADHD don't have reliable access there. Mm -hmm. And we actually have to do more with less connections. It's absolutely amazing that we can do anything. Um, I'll sit in research uh, symposiums and almost get depressed and have to remind myself I have a PhD and I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> because the research is like, yeah, these ADHD saps, they can't do this or this or this. And I'm sitting there as an ADHD sap going, wow, they're right. Yeah. And so the research is really damning toward our ability. But I want your listeners to understand, take a look at yourself. Somehow you're making it happen. And you have this incredible brain that can rewire itself. Mm. But ADHD takes more energy to rewire. And so if we just had a prefrontal lobe, I promise I'm getting to the hyperactive question, Dave. Don't panic here. No, you're good. You're but, good. <laughs> all right. You're like, wow, she took a circuitous manner here. But <laughs> um, we all have the H, the hyperactive, because we don't have that prefrontal cortex to go, yeah, let's discard that thought. Go ahead and tune this thought in, just this thought, focus on this thought. We don't have that kind of language going on. Mm. In fact, in fact, we have about 10, 20, 50 million thoughts bouncing <laughs> around at the same time. Right? Yeah. And so the hyperactivity can either, it, it's more of a body thing. Either it's just encapsulated in the brain, ping, 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 all those thoughts, ping, ping, ping. Or it slides out, too, of our body. Mm. And our bodies, ping, 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 in our nervous system. Uh-huh. And so the H is always present. Yeah. Either it's internalized or it's externalized. But I, I want, I, I really want your listeners just to kind of appreciate, man, my brain's amazing. Because in spite of all those pinging thoughts, somehow yeah. I get something done. Yeah, we do. I mean, it, it is a miracle uh, in a lot of ways, like of, of some of the, like, I, I I, I'm still amazed that I was able, like I wrote my, my book, uh, new business networking. I wrote that book with ADHD untreated, not knowing I had ADHD. It's an 80,000 right. word book, you know, it's published. Right. The, I think the only way I pulled it off was uh, like it first I had a, a contract and I received an advance. So I had a contractual contract. Like I had to get it in on time and the other, so it, it was that kind of virtual gun to my head, so to speak. And then I also had my wife. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> and I live in the South. So she had a real gun to my head. No, I'm just, I can't. I, I joke. <laughs> We're not yeah, freaks. But really. <laughs> but, but really, no. She, But she she constantly, she was the one who was like, okay, you know, get off the roof. You're okay. Come back, finish the chapter. And so she kept me on task because I wanted to quit so many damn times during that process. So um but as I read your book, by the way, like, cause your book was the first book I read about ADHD and it was, it was amazing. Cause as I'm reading it, I'm like, Oh, like, that's why, like you wrote in the book about something about like soft t-shirts and, and I do this, <laughs> I've, I've talked yeah. about it on the show before I do this yeah. anywhere. Like I feel the, the, that sounds so creepy and weird, but I feel like the soft <laughs> It probably is. Some people are like, oh, no, my, it's only creepy kind of if you if you do if what your next sentence is. That makes it creepy. So. Well, that's right. <laughs> so when I'm gagging someone with my soft T-shirt, no. <laughs> right. thank you. A little, little creepy and weird. Um, yeah, but yeah, like just like touching my my soft shirts, or uh, that's part of like the hyperactivity, yeah. or chewing my lips, or my inside of my mouth, yeah. or stimming, as the kids say. Um, yeah. Like just learning all about. Uh, these these things. Even in, in your book, you also mentioned about uh, th this feeling of being like of hating and feeling overwhelmed by the spice aisle. Uh, <laughs> and me, it's malls, just in general, yes. like, mall parking oh. lots and malls. Like I, I get turned around, I get lost. Oh. I, I, I hate them. 
Uh, That's the seventh seventh circle of hell right there. Yeah. On Dante's Inferno, the mall parking lot. (laughs) Um, You know, Dave, this is such a good point because Mm. all of us, whether or not the H is pronounced Mm. or internal, all of our senses are turned up a little bit too high. Mm. And so, again, we don't have that prefrontal cortex going, no, just ignore that buzzing or ignore that your shoes are too tight right now or ignore this. Our ADHD brain's like, I don't know. That seems like important information. Yeah. And we don't, our brains don't know what to pay attention to and what not to. And so we try to pay attention to everything, Hmm. which means then we develop feelings about what we're paying attention to because that's part of the ADHD brain. Right. If we had the prefrontal cortex online in a steady way, we, we wouldn't have the, oh, I hate that scratchiness. Like yeah. I, I hate, um, I'm very sensitive to touch too. Mm. And so, and okay, see that, yeah, yeah. my next sentence is really what matters, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when I choose clothing, uh, I choose chairs to sit on. When I, everything, I don't like certain fabrics. Mm-hmm. Now, what separates us yeah. um, from just absolutely going bonkers is we're like, okay, okay, what would a rational human do right now? Okay, a rational <laughs> human would just get up and switch chairs and not freak out. Mm. Okay, okay, I can do that. Yep, okay. And see, that's the kind of talk we have inside of our head. Yeah. Like, what would a grown-up do right now? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, Yeah. no, 100%. Yeah, I, that's exactly that's exactly what goes through my head. I've, and I guess that's part of like the – I guess the kind of coping mechanisms and sort of reframing as we get older and wiser to realize like how we can do it, where the, the old like bouncing little boy can't do it. And the girl who's like overthinking, and of course I'm generalizing here, but I know with ADHD traditionally, it was like a naughty boy's thing. And, you know, obviously girls uh, had and have ADHD too, but I just think they're smarter than boys. And that's how they were able to learn to like, internalize it more than the boy bouncing off the blackboards. Well, yeah, let me let me just add to what you just said. Mm. Um, if they can, and I've seen women who can't, but a lot of women can understand the girl territory, and the girl territory is not nice. Mm. Girls will cut you emotionally. Mm-hmm. And so girls internalize <laughs> because, let me tell you, socially, ostracism, I mean, it is so, it's so bad out there. Yeah. Um, starting, I'm seeing it starting in third grade. A lot of girls learn to internalize it and some really can't. Uh, some are like always out there and mm. they're going to pay socially and it's really sad. Mm. So I, I, that's kind of my working theory on why girls go underground faster. Yeah. Um, also estrogen, the effects of estrogen on our bodies affect different thinking styles. So that's interesting. it's a little bit of that. I've read that that there's like a three year delay in the development of the prefrontal cortex for ADHDers. Is that is that right? Okay, so yes, and and it's very consistently three years, except there's one window of time, and it's and I this is anecdotal, hmm. but I have seen twenty one year olds regress back to acting like a sixteen year old. And it's almost like, oh, man, this grown-up stuff, I can't do it. I can't do it. And they almost start to kind of take on behaviors of a 16-year-old. And so here's what I tell parents. Be cool. Be real cool. And understand if your daughter um, reaches 27, she's going to start to kind of see the light. For your son, you're going to have to wait to 29 Mm. because, yes, testosterone delays a lot of mental development. Sorry, that's not being sexist. That's just (laughs) testosterone. (laughs) No, but I mean, I've I've always read, uh, yeah, somewhere between, I think it's 23 is typically like the age you're, you're, you know, the neurotypical neurotypical brain fully develops. So both are are my, so my kids are now, well, they're about to be 17 and 18 respectively next week or next, well, my daughter will be 17 next week and my son will be 18 in just a few weeks here at the time of this recording. But they, they both are talking about like getting cool tattoos 
uh, at some point. And we're like, just yeah. wait till your brain's fully developed before you do that. Right. <laughs> you know, like we're trying to make the case that you're, you're kind of way cooler not to have tattoos these days because everybody has right. one. But I digress. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, hey, by the yeah. way, um, mm-hmm. can we just can I just quickly say something to parents yeah. who might be listening? Like, hey, Please. my kid wants a tattoo, too. Yeah. Um, my, one of my daughters wanted a tattoo and she really, really wanted one. I'm like, awesome. Let's use a permanent marker, draw what you want. Yeah. And let's, let's run a test for a full year. If you still love it after a full year, then let's do it. I'll pay for it. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. (laughs) And she had ADHD and she still doesn't have a tattoo and she's 20, 28. There you go. Success. Yeah, yes. Good. Well, good, and good I'm not opposed to tattoos. Yeah. You guys do you. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing I know about the ADHD brain. The reason I didn't get a tattoo is I couldn't commit to something mm. that I would want for the rest of my life. And I got one because I was young and stupid and just jumping into every idea. And uh, yeah. So and yeah. Kind of, Again. Yeah. Yeah. We're not opposed to tattooed people. I right. want to be clear. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I, I want everyone to know, not that, that's not what I'm talking about. Right. I'm talking about the, yeah, I have this on my body now kind of feel. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Hey, uh, I, I'm curious too, like what your take is on, you, you know, obviously it, it hasn't been all like puppies and roses since being <laughs> diagnosed this year. I've been thinking a lot about, and I've been, and I've said this kind of a lot on the show, but like I'm trying to obviously avoid dwelling too much on the past and, and blah, 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 because I don't want to go to dark places there. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Yada, 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 yes. yada, fill in the blank there. I know the traits of ADHD and how they relate to who I am and the decisions and the things that I've done in, in the past, but like how much can I, I, I'm not looking to blame ADHD, but at the same time, right. I'm like, is it, is it me that made that stupid decision or is it ADHD that made that stupid decision? You know what I mean? Okay, Dave, I love this question. Okay, mm. I love this. So imagine two circles that overlap in a Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. Okay. In one circle, we have your personality. And in your personality circle are all those traits that you've built on how to cope with the world. That's kind of what personality is. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and there, there's sometimes that essence of yourself that lies in there, but a lot of it is, is stuff you learned on how to deal with your environment. Mm. Okay. The other circle label that ADHD. And in there are all the times you forgot where you parked in that mall parking lot. And how many times like, okay, I have 15 things to do before this podcast start. Mm. And I only forgot five of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I know I could have written them down, but I didn't guys. So, um, you know, short term memory is in there and all these things. So now when we look at this Venn diagram, there is an overlap Mm. and the overlap is kind of that double whammy space. And what something, some things I help clients do is, hey, let's explore what's in your personality circle and let's explore what's in the ADHD and let's learn about your double whammies. Because the double whammies, my friend, that's what's going to get you in trouble. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> my personality, my personality, so personality circle is highly impulsive hmm. and intuitive. Whoopsies. Now, when I look at the ADHD, we know that ADHD exacerbates that trait in my personality. Mm. So I have even more of a risk of making impulsive decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I put myself on high alert anytime my double whammies come up. So it's almost like you have a list of these double whammies (laughs) that you can refer to or... or, or I mean, I, I I would imagine just just writing them out would probably be enough in some respects mm-hmm. to make one remember what those are. Because like for me, you know, for me it was it was you know drinking too much and smoking t- like too many cigarettes back in the day. It was like this thing around addiction. I mean, I quit smoking I don't know like twenty five years ago, and I quit drinking three years ago. Um, 
and but I find that like it's it's this excessive thing. Like my wife and I have been together like twenty five years, so she is actually she actually would do this thing where she'd go excessive, Dave, like kind of under her breath when I was like having what another beer? Really, are we gonna have another beer, Dave? Excessive, Dave, or you know, or eating like all the kids' chicken fingers that they didn't <laughs> eat on the table. I would clear their plates. Okay, now you're meddling. That's my addiction. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, no, it, I don't yeah. have the turn off button. Button yeah. For food. Right. right? Yeah, no, yeah. I'm so aware. one of the double whammies I have um is actually I just recently found out that's actually a genetic trait hmm. is ooh, Tamara, you're not allowed to do that <laughs> because uh, you don't have the shut off valve. Yes. But it's not so, as simple as just stopping yourself. I, I I suppose I mean with with chicken fingers as delicious as they are, yes. one can maybe stop, but when it gets to more serious addictions right with with you know actual drugs and things yeah that, that's when things can go south quickly right yeah so addictions would actually when i work with clients and they have um so all adhd people have the ability to become addicted mm-hmm. and it's in in my head it's whether that circle is present and infecting their uh infecting affecting their life mm-hmm. or not Mm-hmm. And so if I work with a client and I know there's an addiction present, I add another circle. And so then I watch where the all three of those overlap. And so mm-hmm. then we really watch that hot spot and we, we kind of learn where how to navigate this. So when my girls turn 21, the ADHD girls, mm-hmm. um, you know, I have all girls. Uh, girls going to bars is a scary thing. Mm-hmm. Because um, of how women can be treated, right? Yeah. And so I really ingrained on them, like, you cannot afford to get sloppy drunk yes. in public. You cannot afford this. And I know I, I, I'm, I wasn't shaming them. I was um, scaring them, <laughs> just yeah. to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, but I wanted them to be very aware, you know, that this is dangerous. Mm-hmm. So uh, we talked about the ring method. So I would have... Have them say, count your drinks. Because what would happen is when I was their age, people would keep handing me drinks and I'd keep drinking. Because at some point, um, if I have a Long Island iced tea, that's a lot of shots, folks. Um, And by the way, I'm no spring chicken. I don't don't drink anymore because my body is like, hey, screw you. You can't handle this. Right. (laughs) But back when I was a kid, Mm. my rule was one Long Island iced tea all night. Mm. And I'm like, that's plenty. Um, my second rule was if it was a single shot drink, I was allowed so many, but I would <clears throat> move my ring on my finger across my finger so that I could keep track how many I had. Oh, that's interesting. And so I worked with the girls to kind of like, what what's your way of keeping track? Mm. And um, I, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone by telling you that I scared my children, but <laughs> um, please, I, I, you know, I'm a positive parent. I love my kids. No, but you got to be realistic. But, I mean, you got to teach, make sure they're street smart and, and safe. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. And that's in ADHD kids. And I know this, I was an ADHD kid undiagnosed, mm-hmm. went to a ton of college parties. Yeah. And now I look back, I'm like, only by the grace of God, nothing bad happened to me. Yeah. Because I, I I made stupid decisions. Like one time I was handed out. I wanted to get out of this house. I'm like, hey, guys, catch me. <laughs> and so I jumped out of a second story window. Oh, my God. And I know. What the heck? Oh. Well, I was kind of handed down. It was a whole thing. Like yeah. reasonable people should not do this. And, and so I'm grateful that I'm okay. But I also wanted my children to know you have ADHD. The mm-hmm. likelihood of you not being able to handle this is real. <laughs> yeah. So let's deal with this. No, yeah, you're absolutely you're absolutely right about that. So what what do you recommend someone someone do who has you know a, a, you know the show is really for you know late diagnosed adults, so people like myself who, I, I, if you don't mind me asking, how old were you when you were diagnosed? You mentioned. <laughs> So it's a little bit complicated. It wasn't until my, I'm 40. Uh, okay. I, I was in my 40s. I'm mm-hmm. 55 right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was a high school teacher and I learned about this thing in the 80s called ADHD or ADD. Right. 
And I'm like, wow, this, this just sounds like how everyone thinks. And, you know, it's really how all my family thinks. Mm. And then I taught high school and I was really good at teaching one population. Mm-hmm. And it was the at-risk kids. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea why, but it's, I understood how they thought. And I never wanted to teach a boring class. So it was a good fit. Mm-hmm. So in a way I knew all my life. But I didn't take it seriously until my 40s. Mm. And that's when you actually got diagnosed. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And of course, I mean, this is, I mean, this is kind of so traditional. Um, it was when one of my children was in third grade and then in fourth grade, she wasn't doing well. Mm-hmm. And we took her to get diagnosed for ADHD and... Um, she had ADHD. And so I realized this little girl needed a guide through life. And I just said, hey, your brain works like mommy's brain. Mm-hmm. And here's how mommy's brain works. And I remember those big blue eyes looking at me and said, how do you know? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll get diagnosed too, sweetie. Ah. But, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, um, I, I wanted to be a Sherpa for my children. Yeah. Um, as it turns out, I have three bio- biological children and two of them have ADHD and one of them doesn't. Mm-hmm. By it's... the way, folks, she grew up like she was the, um, sober one at a frat party. Yeah. So she was very <laughs> responsible. Yeah. <laughs> It is interesting. I remember in the book you talked about, uh, and it, it also kind of reminded me of, of something I did in my childhood, which was um, you mentioned uh, an 11 year old who was doing experiments and caused damage to some property and this like possibility brain. And as a kid, I got thrown out of first grade uh, at around, I guess, seven or eight years old. I got thrown out of the school. Um, in part for ruining a school play, I want to say that I actually, I actually, I actually killed in the school play. I should add it was, <laughs> the only person upset and uh, the only person mad was my teacher. Um, uh, everybody else <laughs> were laughing their heads off. But, um, but the other thing that, that led to the, I mean, that was certainly one of the last draws, but the last draw was I was uh, thrown out of the class like usual for just disrupting. And I was the class clown. So um, so I'd be out in the hall bored sitting there uh, while the class continued. And I took out of my bag, I found an eraser and I found uh, a paperclip. And so I unwound the paperclip till it was straight. And then I stuck it in the eraser. And then I stuck the eraser with the paperclip stuck into it into the electrical socket in the hall of the school. And of course I had no idea what I was doing at all, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I touched the, the, the racer and I got like a little shock and I was like, Oh, Whoa, that's weird. And I did it again. That's weird. (laughs) So then wait, 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 you did it. Yeah. And then your brain's like, that, that moment of the hyenas and um, the Lion King, <laughs> yeah. ooh, 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 do it again, do, do it, it again. Again, <laughs> again, again. Yeah, it was, it was like Bart Simpson with the electric uh, cupcake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, but what happened next was uh, the kids started filing out after class and I started showing them. And next thing I knew, like of all course. the kids were lined up doing this, touching it. And I kind of walked away. And as I was walking away, one kid went to approach to touch it or maybe touched it. And like the whole thing exploded and, and all these like sparks flew out of the wall. Thank God. Everybody was, nobody was hurt. Everybody was oh okay. My gosh. But the power yeah. was knocked out. I mean, we're talking like the late seventies here, probably <laughs> mid seventies. So like the power I'm sorry for laughing. Oh, no, it it is everyone's hard. okay. This is so ADHD of us. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's incredible. So like, and the power was kicked, you know, out of, at the school for, you know, the remainder of some time. So yeah. So that was kind of the last draw and I got, I got thrown out. But I was curious about like this this possibility brain that you wrote about. Okay, so so let's just take your scenario. <laughs> and by the way, dude getting kicked out in first grade, yeah. that's low. Yeah. That's low. <laughs> um, but here's what happened. So so I want your listeners to picture little Dave hmm. in like, okay, 
There's nothing malicious in his body. Mm-mm. He's not even mad that he got kicked out. He just accepts it as a fact of life. Like, yeah, clearly mm-hmm. I couldn't manage this. Yep. And so he's he takes, there's nothing bad going on in his head. Uh-huh. He just has this what if brain. So he's like, oh, well, I found this paperclip. And obviously every ADHD person is going to play with a paperclip. That's yeah. just begging to be straightened out. Yeah. And so he's like, well, well, I have this eraser. You know, I can put these two together. And then he's like, cool. What are we going to do with this cool new tool? Okay, look for an orifice. What orifice can I stick this in? And unfortunately, his teacher didn't set him a far away from every outlet. Because, guys, that's what you need to do when you have ADHD kids. <laughs> and so his what-if brain, his possibility brain, goes... I will insert this here. And then he did this fabulous, I mean, he's only in first grade, guys, and he's running experiments, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, this is actually incredible mm. and actually speaks to your intelligence. Mm. I know people don't agree with that, <laughs> but this what if brain is like, what would happen if? Mm. And this is the misunderstanding that comes with ADHD. We have what if brains. Well, what if this happened? Yeah. And by the way, some people use what if this happened and create an anxiety force around them. Little Dave uses his what if brain to go, well, what if what if this new tool does this? And he and you know, maybe little Dave even named it like, oh, I created a zapper. Yeah. And so <laughs> and and so he was testing the bounds of electricity mm. in first grade, not knowing any of the concepts really. Um, because, you know, you and I are in the same generation. Yeah. Guys, we're kind of in the forgotten generation. Like, people didn't houseproof no. or kid-proof their houses. They didn't – I mean, if you saw the playgrounds we played on, it's a miracle we're alive. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the, the only of hard knocks. The only medicine in my house was scotch. And the only yeah. person <laughs> – and my dad would be the only one administering it to himself. Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, <laughs> true story, though. One time I was sick, and my parents gave me whiskey in a cup of tea to cut the phlegm. Oh yeah. And I look back, going, "What the, what the damn hell?" Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, so I'm just saying, like, yeah. <laughs> I got sap in my hair, and my grandfather, in lovingly, he wasn't being rude. Um, he poured gasoline on my head to oh get the sap God. out of my hair. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. And it burned. It burned, yes. Dave. It yes. burned real bad. So all I'm, I'm kind of defending little Dave here because yeah. you have to take this like if this happened yesterday yeah. with this Gen Z. I the Gen Z knows about electrical outlets because their parents have been covering them for decades. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But. <laughs> For our generation, no one really kind of went through this. So he's like, hey, what if? Yeah. And it's a great example of now we're going to punish you for your what if brain. Mm. And so your listeners, especially late diagnosed, right, have already been punished for their what if brain. A lot. Yeah. Yep. Now, guys, it's beautiful that we have a what if brain. It's lovely. It's a gift. Mm. But like with every power comes great responsibility. Mm-hmm. So we have to learn how to manage our what if brains and learn how to govern them so that it's a gift and not a curse. So what are some tips in, in doing that? Like maybe like a, a, something that, that a listener can do who was recently diagnosed. Uh-huh. Okay. Good one. Um, so first of all, we want to understand the difference between convergent thinking and divergent thinking. Mm -hmm. Divergent thinking is what we do naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of referred to my divergent thinking earlier when I said, okay, I try to tell a story from the inside out. That's not going to work here. Slow down and tell it sequentially. Yeah. Um, we naturally do the divergent work. In other words, what if? How is this connected? Let's take this one idea and blow it up into pieces. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, the rest of the world works on convergent time. Mm. And convergent time is sequential. 
it waits for people to take turns when they're talking. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a, you know, I can hear one of my clients go, it's a boring way to think. (laughs) It is. It's like a linear way of thinking. Yeah. And guess what? Most of the world wants us to think like that. And so we need to understand when to use our divergent brain and when to use our convergent. And so it's like knowing the difference between a gas pedal and a brake. Mm-hmm. Convergence like the brake, divergence like the gas pedal. We just need to know when to use what. Sometimes, Dave, I can look like a freaking genius <laughs> when I see a divergent thing in the presence especially of um, neurotypicals. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, wow, that's a great idea. And my, <laughs> and you know, my ADHD counterparts are like, yeah, I could have gotten there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if I'm meeting with a whole bunch of neurodivergent people and I'm only using my divergent thinking, I'm going to be highly irritating. Mm. So I need to kind of learn how to tap on the, tap on the brakes, slow down, do the sequential thinking. So when I'm in a meeting, I have a ton of divergent things popping through my head from the colors that uh, that someone's wearing, whether their hair looks good that day, like all of these things are popping in my head. So I open up, um, I have a remarkable pad, but you can do this old school on a piece of paper. And I start keeping track of the things that I want to blurt out. Ah. And it's, it's a whole list. And it, like, if someone's talking, I'm like, well, I have five ideas for what you're saying. And I don't want to wait until they're finished because it's impulsivity, but it's also, I'm going to forget these ideas. Mm-hmm. So I start writing out the ideas. And here's what happens. I look like I'm really smart in taking notes. Yeah. Right? This yeah, is yeah, the yeah. biggest hack, guys. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I just fooled neurotypicals that I'm taking notes. Really, what I'm doing is taking my metacognitive notes. Mm. Here's what's happening in Tamara's head. That's, and so I'm just quickly jotting down my my ideas. That's that's a great it's a great strategy for that, I think. As long as it doesn't say like, you know, all work and no play makes Tamara a dull girl. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I have a code for that. Oh so here's if I That's a shining yeah. reference if 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 uh, anyone listening yeah. is not familiar. Yeah. <laughs> That, that means we've completely lost the plot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I love the reference, by the way. Um, so I have a code for that, though. Mm. Um, and the code is if I start writing sentences yeah. just using um, first letters, mm. that means I'm actually swearing yeah. at people. <laughs> and and I'll just kind of do a quick sentence and then, you know, move on because we're not staying on my idea of, hey, I wish this person would, you know, shut the heck up. Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of write it all in um, in abbreviation yeah. and then move on. It's smart. Like, I, I do the same when I'm meditating. So, like, if I, when I'm, when I'm focused on my breath and I'm, I'm fully on, in on like a 10 or 20 minute meditation, I do keep a pad of paper and a pen next to me. And while I'm, you know, my eyes are closed usually, but my mind is going to go to places and think of things. And one of the ways that I handle that is just to jot down what I'm thinking. And then like very quickly, just like you're describing here, just jotting it down and then getting back to to the task at hand. Um, In that case, is is really just meditating uh, in that moment. You've you've written about like, or, or talked about in some interviews about like pink marshmallows and toothpicks as it applies to convergent <laughs> and divergent thinking. We usually yeah. share, share that because I, I think, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I found it really interesting. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, so uh, this came from when I was uh, teaching educational psychology as a professor. Um, I gave my uh, students a pile of they were, they happened to be pink marshmallows because, um, that's what I found at the store that day. Mm. Um, and they were the mini marshmallows. And I said, okay, pile them up. And so they would pile it up. And I'm like, so these pink marshmallows represent ideas. And look how you stacked ideas on top of each other. Mm. Now, and I was teaching this thing called schema. Um, and so I now, then I handed people toothpicks. And I said, now make a structure out of 
these. Mm -hmm. And so my students were making these, you know, very interesting structures. Um, I, sometimes people collaborated because, you know, there are divergent people in my class mm -hmm. um, to see how big their structure could get. And, and so I hope your uh, listeners are imagining little marshmallows connected, lots of marshmallows connected with toothpicks, mm -hmm. right? So it kind of, a lot of them turned out like a sphere. Some of them look like a tower. And what, when we do that, that's called schema. That's when we put a lot of ideas and connections together. And in, in psychology, that's schema. Now, the interesting thing is we have different areas of focus. So neurotypicals tend to focus on the marshmallows, the ideas. Um, those of us with ADHD, we tend to be the toothpick people. We want to focus on, but what's the connection between these? So if this mar mar marshmallow is connected to this marshmallow, what does that mean? Mm. And so we're the, the toothpick people. And by the way, that's what can make us look like geniuses if we put it together. By the way, one of my favorite games I used to play with students is when they would would be studying to help them build their schema to focus on the toothpicks. So I'd hold up two flashcards and say, how are these two related? Uh -huh. And it could be really random different things. And by the way, I'm, I'm a cruel game player. So I would add in <laughs> my shoelaces and mitochondrial function. Right. Like, you know, like, right, right. how are these two related? Yeah. But the thing is, it would increase their learning because they focused on the toothpick. We remember toothpicks. I wonder if every improviser has ADHD because I studied improv with Second City in Toronto and I, I've performed improv a lot over the years and have done uh, a lot of corporate workshops on communication skills and using improv. Uh, do, do you, uh, I'm curious if, if you've had any experiences with, with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, the only people that truly like improv are ADHD divergent thinkers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because we're like, yeah, put me in, coach. This is how my brain works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can actually, if you go back and look at the comedians and how their shticks, you can tell if they're ADHD or not. Mm. Now, some of them actually talk about their ADHD. Mm. Um, and it, it's a little bit harder now that uh, shows are really rehearsed well and you can tell. Um, but I can tell the difference between an ADHD, uh, comic and a non ADHD comic. Mm. And it's because there's something, there's a look they get in their eye because they're getting dopamine from the laugh. Mm -hmm. They're getting dopamine and their brains are like, cool, more toothpicks. I can bring it. Yes. And so they love, um, one time I was doing a presentation, uh, you know, ADHD people have different careers. Um, in one career, I was a college professor and I spoke a lot at other colleges on teaching faculty how to teach. Hmm. And someone came up afterwards and said, do you do improv? Your timing is impeccable. Ah. And I've, I, I laughed. I'm like, no, just had some caffeine. This is pre-diagnosis. Yeah. But now I know, no. They were laughing. And my little 12 year old girl's like, hey, let's go after those dopamine hits and make them laugh more. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people with improv really probably have ADHD tendencies. Yeah. Last, last year I did, uh, uh, in, in true ADHD form. I've always, like as a public speaker, I do a lot of, a lot of speaking. Uh, it's a big part of my business and teaching speaking skills and things. And so as a speaker, I study stand up comics and I've always been a big comedy fan anyway. And class clown, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Same here. Yeah. So, so by studying what they do. So I took a course last year and then I did six open mics in six weeks. Uh, of for the first time ever at 50 and and pre-diagnosis by the way and I was doing stand up comedy and it was just a fascinating and I yeah I mean after doing that by the way if if anybody has to deliver a presentation oh my god like six open mics it was I I did well I think but but you know it was as rough as you would expect as well um and after those six six weeks I had a a paid hour 
keynote presentation I was delivering and I was elated. I was like dancing on the stage. The audience were laughing their heads off. I was having the best time because I was like, oh my gosh, these people are here to see me. They're not like other comedians in the back of the room talking over you, <laughs> you know? That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, there's one time people kept laughing uh, and I, I said into the mic very low, I'm like, listen, if you keep encouraging me this way, we're not going to get through this presentation. <laughs> and and they they died laughing even more. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm like, oh, okay. So and I was kind of serious, like, I love you guys. You're cheering me on here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's nothing worse than speaking to a dead audience. Oh yeah. Um, I it's it's really kind of funny because um I have two preferences when I speak. I like to be able to see who I'm speaking to. Yeah. Um, like if the crowd's too big and I can only see the lights, that kind of creeps me out. Yeah. Because like you, and I, I bet I would put money on this, you read people's faces. Oh, yeah. To go, what can make them laugh now? Yeah. Because as an early class clown, you learned, yeah, this is boring. But if I make people laugh. Mm -hmm. And so you studied faces to know, like, oops, nope. Too soon. Okay, don't don't make that joke. Do this instead. It's wild to look back at all the content I've produced over the years, the blog posts, the podcasts, emails, or like uh, newsletters, um, uh, yeah, all that stuff, my books. And looking back through it all and realizing like like I could take it all and 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 repurpose it all now for ADHD folks because <laughs> like why is squirrels yes. listening? Because it is – it's weird because like I was – writing sort of stuff to help other people. And and while it was helpful and is helpful, it's especially helpful for people like us because yeah. yeah so it's, yeah. it's such an interesting thing. Yeah. Now you just have a name for it yes. before you didn't have a name. Yeah. And yeah. now you're like, Oh, that's the ADHD difference. Mm -hmm. Oh and my God. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you yeah. off. No, no problem. No, I was going to say, I could I could talk to you for hours, and I can't believe an hour has already flown by. Are you doing okay on time right now? I am, yes. Okay, yes. I just wanted to make sure. Tell me about the this uh, process you have that you work with your clients on for finding their metaphor. I think this is something oh, really yeah. impactful. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so the reason metaphor is important to ADHD people, and this is – most ADHD people, when I say this, you know, obviously I'm kind of generalizing, but because that prefrontal cortex tends to be quite literal, there's a spot behind our brain, the DMN, mm -hmm. that's the seat of inspiration, uh, reflection, and metaphorical thinking. And many of us go there to access that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, I mean... Guys, when I tell you our brains are so amazing, because according to research, we shouldn't be able to do any of this. And yet, neuroplasticity, we go to the DMN to try to do prefrontal cortex functions. Mm -hmm. Enough nerdiness. So <laughs> I found that if my clients can conceptualize their ADHD into a metaphor then we'll solve for that metaphor. And that's a good place to start in coaching. Because if I just go, hey, so what's bringing you here today? And they're like, uh, I'm going to get fired at work and I have to tur you know, mm -hmm. turn in my sales reports on time. Well, you're right. We need to solve that problem. But it's not going to engage their entire system as a metaphor would. And so instead I say, hey, I get you're here for some good reasons. I promise you we're going to get to them. But first, could you talk to me about what your ADHD feels like in a metaphor? And some people can think about it immediately. Mm. And others will need to just kind of, can I have a week to do this? I'm like, absolutely. So, Dave, I'm going to ask you if you have one in just a second. Mm -hmm. So you've been warned. Mm -hmm. um, so... My metaphor for ADHD is a two-legged race or a three-legged race, mm. but I'm in a two-legged race. I'm in just a normal <laughs> race, Yeah. but every morning I have to get up, strap my leg to this 
chick's leg that I call ADHD Tamara, <sighs> and we have to wind them together, and we have to learn how to do this. And frankly, I get really mad at her because you know what she does halfway through the race? She sits down and she doesn't do much. Right. She wants to pick dandelions and I'm dragging her. And this is a bit dark, but I'm going to confess this to your group because right. you guys are mature. <laughs> yeah. Um, I used to, I got through my PhD just by knocking her out and dragging her body across the finish line. Right. <laughs> and. That's not very self-loving, guys. And <laughs> I had to learn other ways. Hmm. But I had to deal, I had to solve that metaphor. Um, a couple of my other clients, uh, one of my clients says, you know what? ADHD to me is a piece of toilet paper on my heel. Uh-huh. It's just always there embarrassing me. Hmm. So, so we start to solve the metaphor. And when we address the metaphor and fix the metaphor, that's a that's a great place for people to kind of start to address their ADHD issues. So Dave, what's yours? Yeah, it's a good question. The way I've been referring to it is my operating system because I'm a nerd. Yeah. I'm, I'm nerdy that way. And so, Clearly. but I almost, I almost feel like it's like, like, a, like the, like Apple's iOS operating system in an Android device <laughs> or, or vice versa, yeah. right? Like it's mm-hmm. like, it does not compute. And, and right. it's not, it's often not running. It might even run like certain programs will run and some will run better than others, but, the, but it's running slower. It's sluggish. Things aren't quite mm-hmm. where, what they're, it's not running well a lot of the time yeah. and it's not running to its full potential a lot of the time. And that's, Oof. that's how I feel a lot of the time is that I'm, I, I'll, and I do a little bit of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll fall into the comparison trap of looking at others yep. and wonder what the hell, what do they have that I don't have? Why am I not where I need to be in my career? Um, and, and, and things like this year, for some strange reason, this year has been slower than previous years for my business and I work for myself. So I only have myself to blame for that. So, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, operating system tends to be, yeah, my metaphor. Yeah. So, so to your listeners, if they were a client, I, I'd kind of say, okay, so here's what I heard. Hmm. You feel like you have an operating system in the opposite. Like it's not, it's not congruent. Hmm. And so you're feeling a lot of like frustration with the lack of congruency. And, and so through talking, you know, I'm rushing this because, you know, this isn't coaching, hmm. but Dave, do you mind if I continue talking yeah. about you? Oh no! Okay. Tear- yeah, 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 yeah. I'm an open, I'm an open right. book. Tear me apart. Okay. Uh, no, um, I would say so. Dave, something we have to work on is what do we expect from ourselves? Um, you're clearly an intelligent person, so let's work with. You know this. You do. I mean, I think your metaphor is incredibly accurate, hmm. right? Like, I have an accurate metaphor, like. It's a three-legged race every day, folks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just hope I can make it and just I try to run with the two-legged people as well as I can. So it's accurate. So what is it that you have to accept? So what are the things that we can accept about your metaphor? And what are the things that we can address in your metaphor? Yeah, I Because think- there's a lot of, yeah. you know, well, and you're, you said you're newly diagnosed. So there's a lot of acceptance still mm-hmm. because you're, you, you have to grieve some some systems and you wish you had a different operating system, but how, how could we accept the metaphor and work on what we have? Yeah. I mean, personally, I think obviously I'm, I'm currently working with a ADHD coach and I'm now seeing a therapist, uh, like a psychologist. Um, I've changed my prescription to something better that oh, and, and more appropriate and seems to be helping. And I think also just for me, yeah, it just it helps for me to be open. In fact, my my wife and I just had a really deep heart to heart yesterday uh, conversation about kind of the, the everything, and you know, and she's neurotypical. So for her, like, yeah. it, and she's a school teacher, so you know, she's mm-hmm. she said I had ADHD for years. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, the lesson is listen to your spouse, uh, people. Yeah, so I'm I'm 
yeah, I guess that's kind of how I'm handling things. I'm just trying to. So yeah. you're, yeah, and you're still, you're, you still don't even know fully what your metaphor means, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And so the important thing is, like, okay, how do I keep addressing this metaphor? Mm. And because you have a partner who can you can trust, mm-hmm. you can go, hey, honey, here's my metaphor, and sometimes you're going to see me get frustrated because I'm, I'm still working with a sluggish system and they're not made for one another. And I get frustrated about that, but feel free to go, Hey, Dave, I think that's an operating system issue. Yeah. How about you don't sweat the small stuff here? And so really the next thing is to share your metaphor with people you trust mm-hmm. because you'll keep getting more and more um, feedback from your metaphor. Uh, you know, there's times I, you know what my ADHD version of myself does? Hmm. She will not run if she's hungry. Yeah. So I got to keep that girl fed. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Oh, by the way, in my mind, for some reason, she's 12. <laughs> um, so I got to I'm like, oh, we don't want to stop for lunch, but I've got to feed her or else she's going to sit down for the rest of the, of the day. Hmm. Um, so I keep incorporating my metaphor into how I'm understanding ADHD so that I can actually come up with good strategies. It, it sounds also like you're like part of the strategy is at least for you is to almost, I don't want to say obviously split personality is definitely not what I'm, I'm going for here, but it's almost like there's, you're referring to, you know, your, your other version of yourself, which is with ADHD and, and, yeah. and how to handle that. Are there any tips for approaching that without, you know? know. Yeah. Dave, thanks for the opportunity to promote my next book. Uh Um, I actually go into this um, in a lot of detail. Mm. Um, So in chapter three of my next book, I talk about our ADHD monkeys. And I go through and we go through and name the ADHD monkeys that we each have. Mm -hmm. Now, I have monkeys that you might not have. And so I have to deal with my top five monkeys daily. And okay, Maybe some of your clients are like, whoa, now you're mixing metaphors. Yep, you're right. (laughs) Um, And I was an English teacher. That is a shameful act. But um, when we go through and name the parts of our ADHD, then we learn to talk to those parts. So, for example, one of my ADHD monkeys is Critical Kelvin. And Critical Kelvin pops on my shoulder and it's like, well, clearly you're going to fail at this. And on some days, I really want to believe him. And then sometimes anxious Amy pops on my shoulder and goes, you know what? I would listen to him because he's probably right. And so now I have two monkeys ganging up, right? And so um, kind of picturing our ADHD, kind of breaking it down into different parts is really important. Yeah, that's that's great. And I I think that's, yeah, that's a great approach to it, to to identify these different uh, yeah, these different uh, sources of, of self doubt or, or of just beating yourself up. I think that's really important. Yeah. And and uh, I know we're gonna we're gonna uh, wrap things up here in a moment. But I, I did want to ask you too. Uh, you know, talking about my neurotypical wife, um, and and it sounds <laughs> like your next book will be a, a good source uh, for this too. But like, are there other resources for uh, neurotypical spouses to? read or watch or, you know, learn from to better understand how their, their spouse operates. So, you know, I mentioned Barkley. He's, he's a good person to watch. Um, so here's my advice to neurotypicals. Please don't trauma bond with other neurotypicals about how lousy your ADHD spouse is. Mm. Okay. So we have to start there. We're dealing with a neurological difference. So Dave isn't a big dummy. He's not a big jerk. Mm -hmm. He has neurological differences that he's finally understanding what they are. And so we want to open up the dialogue and we want to be curious. Um, And so I, you know, I don't want to shamelessly promote my book, but Mm -hmm. your brain's not broken. I writ, I wrote it so that neurotypicals could read it Mm -hmm. and go, Oh, Okay. Okay. So this is why when Dave tries to tell a story, 
he tells the punchline first. Yeah. Now, you probably have more training than that, but that would be an ADHD thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I really want to encourage I, I I really want to encourage all neurotypical spouses to just start by being curious mm-hmm. and open and learning. And that that's really um you know, Dave, you just got really frustrated in the spice aisle. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. And obviously not when you're still ticked about the cinnamon, where the cinnamon was. Right, right. But but after that, hey, can we talk about that? Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest gift is saying, is it you, me, or was that ADHD? Yeah. And I think you just named your next book. <laughs> well, you know what? That is that is on the block to be talked about. So. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's a good name. Um, how can and for, I, I have to say thank you so much for for this and, and for your time. I, I really do appreciate it, and I really am thankful for uh, the work you're doing. How can people get a hold of you and and learn more about what you do and find your books and all the good stuff that you do? Yeah, well, Dave, I like you, and I'll be back anytime you ask me. So, <laughs> Thanks. um, uh, so people can find me at tamarosier dot com, T A M A R A. R-O-S-I-E-R dot com. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining me. And yeah, this has been fantastic. So I appreciate it. Oh, you're great. I can tell you've done this for a long time. So thanks. Thanks for having me on today. Hey, thanks for listening to Wise Squirrels. It has been amazing to share this with you. Best way to show your support for the show. Leave us a review, follow the show and share it with the people in your life. We drop new episodes every two weeks, so stay tuned for that. Plus, drop by wisequirrels.com or click the link in the podcast description, and you'll find a lot of different resources like articles, a, an assessment, a newsletter, lots of good stuff over at wisequirrels.com. So drop by, let me know what you think, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Hey friends, Wise Squirrels needs your support. We're looking for sponsors for the podcast, for the website, for the newsletter. We'll give you some shout outs on social and all the good places. Reach out to us today. Hello at wisequirrels.com. And in the subject, just write sponsorship and we'll follow up with you directly. Thanks. Wise Squirrels is brought to you by The Root Down, an ADHD inspired presentation and process to know, respect, and connect yourself. Available now for conferences and savvy companies, The Root Down will bring your team together, teach them about neurodiversity, and a lot more. Check out The Root Down, read the reviews over at wisequirrels.com today.